Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download at www.audiblepodcast.com slash freedom train. Over 75,000 titles to choose from for your iPod or MP3 player. Ah, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Prince Podcast on Freedom Train Online.com. This is your host, Van Husking Dean, Michael's Nazi Germany brother in charge. Anyway, folks, welcome to the show. I'm bugging out. It's been a crazy day. Of course, we are here at the Prince Podcast. And of course, we have a round table of experts. So we're going to go around the room quickly. And first, we're going to go to my man, Mr. Dave Dropping. How are you, sir? I am doing well, fellas. Heidi ho. Yes, yes. And we're also joined by Mr. Big Sexy and Sack. How do? I am ready to rumble. Let's get it on and let's make it happen. All right, all right. And then last but, last but not least, straight from Flavor Foundation Radio, my man, Big Ken. What's up, sir? What's going on, fellas? Let's, let's get this thing popping, man. Let's go. Yes, yes. And today we're going to be doing one of our Reloaded style reviews uh, of a classic album. And we are going to cover the Parade album, which is uh, sometimes known as the End of the Cherry Moon album or you know, music from the movie Under the Cherry Moon. We're going to get into that today, track by track. Uh, so you know how we get down. Let's just get into it. But wait, quickly one second. Um, we are looking at, uh, hopefully next week we'll have the Ebony Magazine interview. Uh, looks like there is no CD. There's, not, there's no album associated with the uh, magazine, but there's definitely, I guess, uh, hopefully a meaty interview. Uh, I'm sure there'll be some hints of whatever he's got coming up next and all that good stuff. But the cover of the album is online and there's a few little, well, I guess there's a teaser to the uh, interview on ebonymagazine.com, I believe is the site. So, there's some things bubbling in the Prince world we can look forward to. Um, other than that, uh, I believe he's going on tour uh, over in Europe. And some, some dates about to start coming up, or they've already been announced, and you can go to the site and check those out. So without further ado, let's get into Parade. And I just want to set this up. I, I always say this story, but this story to me just illustrates everything that Prince is about to me sometimes. And uh, it all started on, let's see, April 17th, 1985 in Studio 3 at Sunset Sound in Los Angeles. And this is uh, 10 days after the completion of the Purple Rain Tour and then a few days before the release of the Around the World in a Day album. Prince goes into the studio and just right off the cuff, uh, records the first four tracks of the Parade album in sequence live by himself. Um, at the time, it was called Wendy's Parade, New Position, I Wonder You, and Under the Cherry Moon. And it is the exact way he played it, it is the exact way that it is on the album. I just think that that is just so brilliant and just shows his work ethic, even though he was already on top of the game and, just came off a big tour of his career and about to drop, you know, the highly anticipated album that we talked about in the last show. He's still right back in the lab, putting in work, no time for rest. I love that. Uh, that's, that's, that's the type of style I'm trying to do. It may not be about music, but just whatever I'm doing, just go hard. So anyway, I love that. So let's start at the top. First track is Christopher Tracy's Parade. And I pass the baton to Mr. Big Ken. What's I get up? to open the Reloaded show? Yes, sir. <laughs> Damn, I feel like Neo in this month. Yeah, man, this is a, a wonderful track. To me, I think this song is the perfect opening for this type of album, man. I, I hear this song, and, and, and it's, it's funky, of course, but it's got this whimsical playful, you know, energetic vibe all at the same time. Almost kind of like a circus-type vibe almost, man. It just, 
I've always looked at this song as like a a shot across the bowl, if you will, that kind of lets you know that you're in for something special. And, and it's basically set the tone, uh, in my opinion, of all the, the wide range of styles that, that came with this record. It's, you know, stuff that he hinted at a little bit in Around the World in the Day. And to me, this track more or less just serves notice that ready or not, you know, he was taking it to the next level, as you alluded to already. And I just remember, man, when I bought the cassette of this and I, I brought it home, I just remember being floored by this song on my first listen. I mean, I was intrigued by it. But I didn't fully understand what I was even hearing because it was so vastly different than anything I'd heard from him before then. And it wasn't what I expected, you know, because when the album came out, you know, Kiss as a single was already out. So I, I, I heard, heard that. And so I'm expecting more, you know, something more along those lines. And then, you know, Christopher Tracy's Parade comes on and it's just like, man, it's so different. It just blew my mind. But I, I loved it immediately. I, I was enamored. Uh, then and now still, man, with the strings, the brass, you know, they add a whole new set of colors to this already great song. Uh, you know, Prince's vocals are per pretty much perfect. And and now, you know, after seeing the movie that accompanies uh, this record, every time I hear this song, there's no way I can listen to it without picturing that, you know, panoramic views of, of Nice, France that you see in the movie at the start. So it's just a, a wonderful song, man, excellent track. All right. Next up is Day Dropping. Maybe not. <laughs> uh, let me see. Whoops. Hold on a second. Yeah, I'm oh. sorry. Turn the, turn the mic off on this. <laughs> yeah, I was about to uh, say, you was giving us the Darth Vader breathing there for a minute. So, <laughs> uh, Yeah, I, um, I agree with everything that, that we can said on it. Um, it, it was a good intro. I don't, I don't think it was it was the strongest intro, but it was a great intro for for the album because it really kind of set you up for what the majority of the mood of the album was going to be. Uh, also, like Bacon, when I first heard it, I was um, I was kind of kind of taken aback by it. I, I didn't I, I knew there was going to be something different. Yeah, I mean, just from the album cover alone, I knew something was going to be different here, but um, I. I um, wasn't quite sure what to expect, and when I heard that, I was—it was like a blast of music, of, of orchestrated music thrown at me. Uh, it really threw me off. Um, but uh, as as cool as, like I said, the intro is, I don't think it was as hard of an intro that I would have liked to have heard on an album. But it was still a, a nice, nice intro nonetheless. Um, and and then you got your real first good earful of Claire Fisher in, up in the mix and you just can't go wrong when when he's him and Prince are are, are, are holding hands um, as much as I like this tune I would have liked some still more instrumentation just to make it more of an impact to begin with uh, more lyrics in it but it's it's great it just a little bit longer would have been perfect on it for, for me for my taste on it um, for in order for it to get a higher rating but giving it an, a rate on this one as an intro, good, but not that great. And for the fact that um, I would have liked a better type of uh, rhyme that he did with, instead of saying Little Girl Wendy's guitar, uh, rhyming with, um, you know, so so he runs to his evil car. It, it just didn't quite work out the way, he, the way he changed the lyric on it with Christopher Trace's parade, or it was the Christopher Trace's piano. Um, so with just little tiny flaws like that, um, I give it a, an 8 out of 10, but it's still a great intro, just not the best intro. All right, Big Sexy and Sat. You know, I have to co-sign with what, what they dropped in Big Ken and Sat. It's a great opening piece, and for me, it also segues, because you can hear a lot of the influences and textures from around the world today come to the fore in this thing with the Claire Fisher part, with the whimsy that, that's happening in it. You know, you know the movies come out, you know, in the background somewhere. You can feel the comedy. You know, feel feel the happiness, feel the joy. And it's like, here we go. The, the roller coaster is starting again. This is something new. And it's like, I've heard the little girl Wendy's version, and this one is obviously completed and a lot more fully done. But, yeah, there's a lot of the, the instrumentation, a lot of the horns, excuse me, a lot of the, the strings. And it could be a little longer to me. I like, I like a lot of music, but at the same time, this was right at the cusp of transforming from vinyl to CD, so people really couldn't take advantage of the expanded use 
of that format. Having said that, and I'm sure if this were to come out today, it would be a lot, all the songs would be a lot longer because that's a common thing in this album. A lot of the songs are too short for my personal taste, but this is still a good funny piece. All right, and I'll just add that um, at the time when I first heard this, I think, you know, uh, Ernie was saying, and I'll say this, I was uh, I was taken aback. Uh, I didn't know what to expect, and this was not what I expected. Uh, it took me a minute to get into it in the sense where I could understand it. I just felt like it was just this avalanche of new stuff, you know, the sounds and the strings and all that. Prior to this, uh, any sort of, I guess, uh, you know, R&B or, or, you know, black music didn't have anything like this from what I was listening to at that time. Uh, I would only equate it to, because I was into John Williams, I could understand somewhat of it, but I never would have expected Prince to be all into that, you know, going into that direction. So it was a lot to take in. It took me a minute to get into this. Um, it was a head, <laughs> it's a head buster. If you had come in from everything you've heard previous, even around the world in the day, it was still different and i'm trying to figure out you know what's going on and learning but it still was it took me a minute to hear the groove of it for a second because i just for me i'm always looking for oh okay he's he gonna have that funk or something and it took me a minute to like okay wow this is a whole different way of doing it so uh that's what that's what i'll say about this in, in hindsight now of course i love this song and uh it took many years later, but when I finally heard a live version of this, that's when I really was like, okay, wow, I see what this song can really be, you know. So anyway, uh, we'll keep it moving. Next up is New Position. And we'll switch it up a little bit, go to uh, Big Sexy. Okay, New Position is a, is a personal favorite of mine, simply because it's, it helped plant the seed of my going into law. And I'll make that, you know, clear in a minute. Uh, I think it's a good little funk ditty, but the thing that stands out the most for me, I remember when I bought this, I, it was my first apartment, and I'm, I'm playing it on vinyl, and it got to this one portion where he says, in the background, P-U-S-S-Y. I'm like, what did he say? I jumped up and brought the needle back, like, you just spelled out the word? You know, what I just spelled out, I'm like, far out. And so I put on my Walkman, I'm walking around campus, you know, that day, you know, all through that semester, counting out the word pussy. And, of course, I got in trouble. And then that's what started the whole thing about First Amendment and music, which led me into the whole two-life crew thing a few years later. But other than that little one bit, I think the fun song, it could be a lot longer. You know, it's only a couple of minutes. I'm like, come on, man, if we're going to try a new position, let's get in there and work this thing out. And, you know, really let the band open up. But, again, I'm thinking a lot of it is the, is the uh, constraints of vinyl at that time. I'm guessing. I don't know. I think it's a fun piece, but it's just not long enough. All right. Uh, big uh, Ken, sorry. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, I, I always think that this is a, another great old new song, right? Because I think this is an older cut that, was, uh, that he had uh, first written a few years earlier than this, and he just kind of pulled it out and dusted it off uh, for this one. But nonetheless, man, it's, it's it's crazy funky, just, you know, like everything else on this record. You know, I, I, I'm really feeling his drumming uh, and his bass work, but his drumming, drumming in particular in this song is really in the pocket, really tight, it's on point. So it's just not much to say about it. It is fairly short. I mean, it could be longer, but, you know, it still serves its purpose well in, in the location that it's in and the length that it is now. So it, it's a cool track. I like it. Word day dropping. Well, Mike, I, I first have to start talking about how what you mentioned as far as the segues on these things and uh, how beautiful the segue is from, from the first track to this one. The way it starts off like a slow beat, it starts going in, starts getting funkier and funkier till it hits in full on. Um, this is one of those tracks where you can say, if anything, this is uh, Christopher Tracy singing this. You know, um, there's there's Christopher Tracy persona all over this. Uh, it's a great compliment to the movie, as it should be. And you know, he sings it cool. Um, it's got cool lyrics in it. He's total pimp on the lyrics, and. Even though, you know, like Vicky said, it may have been a, an older song that was used, I still think that the song kind of has, could be used even as a double meaning. I've always thought this on it, 
with with the lyrics, especially with that second um, second uh, verse where he starts uh, saying, you know, honey, we can't last without a shot of new spunk. Honey, forget your past. You got to try my new funk. Straight out telling folks, the listeners, that, hey, this is new. This is some, some new joint stuff coming out here. This whole album is new. The whole sound is new. Get with it because this is where I'm at. This is, this is what you're going to get. And I always thought that that was kind of cool. Um, and then, yeah, you got the P.U.S.S.Y. thrown in there for good measure. You can't go wrong with that, man. It's, I mean, it's a funky track. Again, great instrumentation. In my opinion, much stronger than the first track. It's, it's sexy, not dirty, minus the, the uh, P.U.S.S.Y. part. But still, it's awesome. It's an excellent segue into, into the next song. Again, you got the segue thing happening, and it, it works perfectly. Um, could have been a little bit longer, but, I mean, that's really the only knock on it. For me, uh, this one also, like, uh, Big Sexy, this one's a personal favorite of mine. It's just really cool the way it works out, and I'd have to give this one a 9 out of 10. All right. Um, and I'll just add, I, I was just blown away by, like, the, the, I guess the steel drums or whatever, the, the, the drumming and the, uh, the bass. The doom, 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 boom, doom, boom. I remember I would just play this over and over and over, and, and I was just like, this, you know, this is that super creative... Nobody else would have did this type of shit. You know what I mean? Like to use those sounds that he was using was just on a next level. You know what I'm saying? Like oh, I'm gonna still hit y'all with the joint, but I'm gonna use some different sounds and instruments that ain't nobody else touching. You know, so it's just so unique. Uh, and I, this song just kills me every time. I still love this. Um, it's one of my favorites too, as well. So uh, just a beautiful j joint. Anyway, keeping it moving. Next up is I Wonder You. And uh, we'll start with Day Dropping. Um, this one, interesting enough, yeah, it's a short track, but you know, this track works. I'm telling you, man, Claire Fisher and Prince equals excellent. Um, and I'd be, I'd be a dummy to not mention how Wendy and Lisa are killing this with the way they're singing. It's almost like a, their song. Um, you know, people, people call certain Beatles songs, uh, McCarthy, Lennon McCarthy compilations. Well, for me, this is a perfect example of a Prince Lisa Wendy compilation. And if there ever was one, it's this right here. It, to me, this one is the gold gem, a gold gem of the revolution era down to that funky guitar that Lisa's going at the end. If it is, uh, Wendy's going at the end, if it is her, um, and I, I want to believe it is. Um, I mean, it's fierce. Uh, everything's cool on it with the way the girls sing it. You know, for me, like I said, I see it more as a Wendy Lisa track than anything else. But it's, it's a beautiful track. It's awesome. Short and sweet. It's not like it had to be any longer. It's just right. And it's cool. This one is that rare 10 out of 10. It just got better. It went from 8 to 9 to 10 because I, I just totally dig this track. All right. Uh, Big Ken. Man, I got to disagree with uh, they dropping. This is a 20 out of 10, man. Okay, <laughs> this is easily, easily. Oh, yeah. I wonder you, man, is easily in my top five of all time. Prince, Prince cuts, okay? And, and you all know that's a lot of Prince cuts that he's made. This is one of the top five. And it, to me, it's it just practically perfect, you know, on all levels. I mean, it, it is super funky, without a doubt. But to me, it just has this quality about it, man. It's almost... Uh, abstract, ethereal, if you will. It's a brand of funk, a style of funk that I don't think too many people would even attempt, much less pull off. You know what I'm, I'm saying? I, I, I can think of very few artists that could even pull this kind of sound off successfully, man. And it's just, it's just great. As, as Ernie alluded to, I mean, Prince is killing it on the bass. I mean, you know, again, his drumming is on point. You know, the chicken scratch guitar, excellent. You know, you blend that with Claire Fisher's exquisite orchestral arrangements, man, and, and Wendy and Lisa's vocals, I mean, it makes for a five-star experience, man. The only thing that would have made this song literally perfect would have been to use Claire Fisher's full orchestral arrangement, and I'm sure most, I'm sure you guys heard that. You know, I know you and Mike, you and I talked about this on an older show. I mean, that, that full version is just unreal with all the sounds that Claire had added to this. You know, and, and also not even just a full orchestral arrangement would have been cool, but if they just would have extended this out just a little bit longer, kind of an extended version, 
this song would have been, I mean, man, it's already doing damage as it is. It would just even be doing more damage. And you actually hear a little bit of it in the movie, you know, during the scene, right. you know, they talking in the bed and whatnot, and, and you hear a little bit of it. And I always thought, that, man, I wish they would just release that full version. Man, I'll pay a grip for that song. But even without all that, man, this song is damn near perfect as it is. And the way that it flows right into Under the Cherry Moon is just it's beautiful. I mean, the all four of these songs, the first four songs, are, are sweet for all intents and purposes, okay, because Prince recorded it that way. But to me, these, these last two in particular, Under the Cherry Moon and I Wonder You How They Roll Together, man, it's just I can't listen to one without the other. I mean that's how that's how good it is because of you know the strong lead in from I, I wonder you is just excellent exquisite track I wish you know this just brings brings back great memories man you know kind of what big sexy kind of alluded to earlier man there was just this sense of excitement and and, and uh, wonder for lack of a better word that you got with new Prince releases and I just remember just again being floored when I heard this this particular cut, and I just kept rewinding the tape over and over to this to this spot, and man, I must have zoned out on this track for at least a half hour before I moved forward, you know, and, and that was just on the initial listen when I first bought the tape. Excellent, excellent cut. All right. Big, <laughs> you got all these big, y'all, big, sexy insect. Uh, I just got a couple things to add to, uh, to what the fellows already said. Great piece. For me, again, it could be longer. Uh, I like, though, the beginning where there's that little track of people laughing. For some reason, that reminds me of Sgt. Pepper. I don't know why. Just us. And I also want to say that if he were to do this in concert, like during musicology where he had a little acoustic set, or sometimes he would do a piano set and he would play a medley of certain things, if he put this in, the building would blow up because it's been absent for so long from the live set. You know, I, I know when you have like 26 albums worth of release stuff, plus all this stuff in the vault, you have a lot to choose from. But if he brought this out, people would lose their minds, guaranteed. I know I would. You know, it's a, again, everything is working, the little chicken scratch guitar, everything, the, the lyrics, everything is perfect, but I just need more. They should have put this on 12-inch. Mm, that would have been crazy. <laughs> Uh, that would have been nuts. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'll just add, I, you know, every co-sign everything you said, this song is is excellent. Uh, I, the same thing, what you say on a lot of these songs, it was too short. It was just really, I mean, before it cuts out, it's just like you don't want it to stop. And so I love this song, always have. And once again, I will reference, you know, the live, when, when they did do it live, and I'm hearing this live as well. Uh, it, again, it even goes to me, it even goes further than the recorded version when they added the, you know, the horns and everything. It's just ridiculous. And they actually made it, uh, they went a little faster and it, it showed you how, how we can do this same song and have the same feel and then turn it into, you know, this kind of jam thing. Uh, you know, it's just a brilliant track. Uh, it really just shows Prince's, uh, you know, mastery and creativeness at this particular time. You know, insane. Uh, so we're going to the next one, uh, Under the Cherry Moon. I'm going to start on, on this one. <clears throat> At the time when this came out, I was not really feeling this song. Uh, I, it was too slow for me, and I just wasn't feeling that vibe of this for whatever reason. It wasn't really until I heard a live version of this, and it's so weird because it was on a... Um, and it shows you how long I wasn't really listening to the song. Somebody had sent me a videotape, or I had a videotape at some point, and a guy was filming his Prince collection with his camera, but he had a parade tour playing in the background, and there was one sequence where they were playing Under the Cherry Moon, and Prince was singing it, and his voice was just sounded really high. It was just weird, but I can really hear the music and the soulfulness in it. And that's when I went back to the record and listened to this. And I was like, wow, this is a great song. I, I always liked the music, but for whatever reason, initially I wasn't into it. Um, but I, I think it is one of his most brilliant you know, pieces of work. Uh, I, you know, With a lot of this Prince stuff, and I say this all the time, I wasn't really ready for a lot of the stuff he was doing when it came out. 
you know, because it was so different from the previous stuff. So I always wasn't initially feeling some things. But uh, anyway, I'll go to uh, Big Sexy and Stack again uh, under the cherry moon. You know, when this, when I first heard this on the vinyl, you know, the album before I saw the film, it reminded me, and this is knowing that the film is coming out, it reminded me for some reason, for some reason of like a Peter Sellers Pink Panther film. I mean, it just fit in that type of that vibe. You know, the piano work and the, the drumming, that's what I just feel like. It's like a piece that could be on an early 60s film soundtrack. And then when I see the film, it's in the movie, but it's not enough in it for my taste. You know, it's, it's a great piece. It encapsulates what he was trying to do with the movie. I just think, I don't know. I mean, I like it, but it's... I don't play it a lot. It's not a skip over. Don't get me wrong, but it just doesn't stand up to the first, you know, first three that we heard, you know, and the ones after that, you know, are even better. But I like it. It's a good little, I don't say segue, but like a little intermission piece before the, you know, for the next section of uh, things coming up. Good, but not great. All right, Big Ken. Wow, I'm going to have to disagree a little there, fellas. I, I, this is to me is, is, is simply just a gorgeous ballad, man, that I feel is highly, highly underrated. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful song, beautiful lyrics that are very passionately delivered, and, and I, I love the instrumentation, uh, particularly what sounds in the background to be, it sounds like a mandolin in the background. Who I, I believe that's what it is, but I could be wrong, but that's what it sounds like. And that little breakdown in the middle is, is nice, too. And, and you know what, Big Sexy, that's actually a good uh, a good analogy. You know, it does, now that, now that you bring it up, it does have a kind of a Henry Mancini-type feel to it. That if you were to add the strings to it, you, you're right. It would, it would take on that vibe a little bit. In fact, speaking of the strings, I mean, in the movie, you hear a little bit of, of this, you know, with the Claire Fisher's orchestra backing it up, and, and it's even more beautiful, man, so... I, I love this song. Now, you know, like I said, initially, you know, I kept rewinding the tape to, you know, repeat I Wonder You over and over again. But once I finally stopped repeating it and just let it play, you know, I, I immediately got into this again, coming out in the, in the context of coming out of I Wonder You. And I look at it as like you're coming down, like, you, like you're exercising. You got worked up and now there's a cool down period, you know, where you have to bring everything back down. And that's how I've always looked at, like, at, at, uh, looked at the, that suite, that four song suite to a degree. But I love the song personally. I, I just think it's you know it doesn't get enough credit in in, in his uh, list of ballads, and we all know he's got a lot of ballads. I think it's one of his most beautiful ones personally, but uh, I like it a lot. It's a personal favorite of mine. All right, they drop it. Yeah, you know, um, I guess uh, B Ken's gonna be a little bit alone on this one here because myself, I it took me a while for me to get into this one. It really did as well. Um, because I guess so much of the gear shift from, from the other ones to this one, it, it's slowing down. You know, in hindsight, I, I really dig the song. And it, like I said, once it grew on me, it, began, it became a, a favorite of mine, of the, of the uh, album. It, and I also agree with, um, with Big Sexy on this one that uh, it's kind of like a take a breather type of track. You know, it, it's, it's a track after you've had the first three songs that... And, you know, like I scored the first one an eight, the second one a nine, the third one a ten. It's just built up, and then it just kind of, not that it stopped, it halted, but it just took, to give you a chance to take a breath now and before you get to the, essentially the second half of the album. Um, and this is a good take a breather track. It's not fluff, though. It isn't fluff, and that's the important thing, because sometimes Prince can give us that breather track that, that doesn't quite live up to the rest of the album sometimes, and, and, and it could be seen as fluff. That's not the case here. Um, there's great melody, and it complements the movie really well. And one thing, and this is this is the interesting thing in general about this uh, this album. Um, Big Sexy kind of alluded to it as well that yeah, this track comes out in the movie, but it's just barely there. And um, it, th this I, I see this um, the soundtrack more as like a, a compliment to the movie as opposed to it being a straight out soundtrack to the movie like say the way um the batman soundtrack was for for the movie where those charts were pretty much laid out the way the way you hear them the way they came out for the most part the ones that did come out this was more like uh, this kind of fleshes out 
the movie once you watch it. You hear the songs and it fleshes out what what's going on and you can relate the lyrics and you can relate the music to the scenes and to the characters. That's why, you know, for me, there's this is more Christopher Tracy pimpage going on right here with, with the lyrics and the way he sings. It's beautifully done. It's seductive and it's cool. But because it was um, so hard for me to get into, although it is a solid track, I couldn't give it more than an eight. So it's an eight out of ten. All right. Keeping it moving. And so at this point, oh, no, we keep going. Uh, next song is Girls and Boys. And uh, for me, this was just an immediate no brainer. I was like, ah, oh, here we go. You know, uh, the smile, you know, gets to come in and the toes get to tapping. Uh, you know, I, I, just to me, this was just like, for what I can imagine France to be, but if it was Funk Town France or something, you know, the, I was like, Prince takes the groove and throws, you know, a different spin on it again. But to me, this is just an undeniable song. And I will say this, I remember when I first heard it, I was like, okay, we got Kiss, you know, that's burning it up. I just expected that this was going to be the next hot joint, you know, and everybody would be all up on it and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so we'll go to Big Ken. Yeah, this is a classic. You know, not really much more to add. I mean, it is instant, you know, you know, it's a no-brainer, real funky for sure. But due in large part to, to the contribution of uh, your, your boy Eric Leeds on the sax. I, I love the lyrics. I think the story within the lyrics are great. All I can say, man, is I hear this song and I instantly picture him and Jerome and those finger waves doing that whole record store bit, man. So, I mean, that image is burning my brain now. And, of course, the crazy video with him, you know, boo, you know, and then laughing his ass off until the, until the video ends. But it's a great track, man. It's a classic. All right. Uh, big, sexy, and sack. Got a co-sign, Matt. Uh, this, this song and this video especially uh, just burned fear into my, my brain. Uh, first of all, the video, I stole that dance step, and I do it to this day when the song comes out of the party. <laughs> I'll just break it up. Hey! Um, Hilarious. Uh, and had they let me on stage during musicology, that was my dance step. That was it. I wasn't doing shit else. I'd have been standing there five minutes doing that one step next to Candy and acting a fool. Um, Eric turned on the, uh, brought out the baritone sax, which I used to play back in, you know, junior high. I love this song. And then the crown jewel of the video, as much as I did not care for the ending with Jerome acting a fool, laughing and whatnot, it showed me Susanna, damn, she was killing it. I'm like, they're twins with Susanna. I'm like, oh, yes. You are the one. She was all that in a bag of lays. I'm like, oh, yeah, I need to be about some Susanna. I love this song. Yeah, yeah. And I just throw in here, trivia-wise, trivia I mean, I'm sure we, we, most of us heard it. Uh, you know, there's the, I guess there's another version of this song, you know, the unreleased version, I suppose. But if I'm not mistaken, it's like, um, is it the bass is taken out or something? Or it's turned down or something? Or there's a guitar part that's not on the release version or something uh, it's probably the bass man there's no real bass line yeah it's, it's definitely mm -hmm. a, a something very different about it but uh, <laughs> I mean it's still essentially the same song but it's interesting when you listen to that other version you can hear that it's it's more just a jam and he's just kind of you know riffing on it you know as far as what he's saying and stuff and I, I, I find that interesting because it kind of really shows the recording process at least when he had the band with them to do a song that they could just groove on something and then, you know, make a song out of that. Um, so anyway, um, day dropping. Well, you know, if, um, track four under the train moon was a breather, take a break track, then the break is over with this one. And you just return right back to the funk. You got Christopher and pimp, but joyful mood. Again, it compliments the movie nicely. And um, me personally, I just wasn't feeling the rap so much that he does on it, but I know it's done in a playful way and it works out in that, in that respect. But, um, you know, I've always liked the song. Uh, but for whatever reason, you know, to me, it, it always seemed like the, the song that I would... I, of all the tracks, this would be the one that I could skip over because I don't know why. I just couldn't tell you why. It seemed more wow. like a background type of song for me instead of a forefront song. It's a good track. I mean... 
I, I dig it. But if there was any one uh, that I would pass up on, it would be this one. Yet, I still score it a solid 8 out of 10. I mean, if you're going to pass up on a song, it may as well be a song like this one if you're going to pass one up, you know, uh, as far as good quality goes. So, yeah, there's not much to it. You guys have pretty much covered it all. It's it's a good jam. Wow, you kind of got me tripping on the passing over. <laughs> oh, I, I well. know, I know. I mean, yeah, you, you, if, I, if, if I pass one over, it's this one, but... All right. You know, barely. I mean, barely. I, I don't know how to explain it. It's just not the type of song that I listen to all the time. I got you. Um, next up, Life Can Be So Nice. Um, I, I'll start this again. I'm not going to go too too heavy, but I would say initially, I I was skipping this song. Because to me, you know, coming off of Girls and Boys, I just thought that this was just too much stuff thrown in there at, at the time. It was just... It was hard for me to make out what actually was going on in the music. It was very, very busy. And uh, and with a lot of songs from Prince, at least back then, to me personally, it was hard for me to understand what he was saying you know, in the lyrics. And sometimes if I don't know what they're saying, I can obviously hear and try to say what I think they're saying, but that kind of pulls me out of it a little bit. And I, I was not really, I just thought that this was too messy back then. Now, 2010, after all said and done, you know, this, oops, so we had a little technical difficulty right there, so I'm going to take advantage of this uh, technical madness and uh, play our um, sponsor ad here, and then we'll get back into the show, so I'm sorry about that, I didn't cut this on purpose, but uh, I had a little problem technical, so we'll be back, hold on. We are proud to announce our sponsor for today's show, and it is Audible.com. And Audible, you can go in there and get you a free 14-day trial. It doesn't cost you anything. You just go in there and sign up. you got 14 days to download any book you want. You keep it. It's yours. You can cancel at any time. But how do you get this plan, they say? Well, you got to first go to audiobookdownload.com at www.audiobookdownload.com. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> no, for real. You uh, you can go and get a free audiobook download at www.audiblepodcast.com slash freedom train. And you can get books. I, I'm going to see if there's Zane on there. That's one of my favorite authors and Octavia uh, Butler. And I've been told they have over 75,000 titles. They do. I am actually a user of the service myself. Um, yeah, I don't know if they got the same. I'm going to check it out because okay. uh, that would be interesting to hear that, to hear it. And then it's like, who's, who are they going to get to read it? That's a whole oh, they should get Toya to read it. Okay, that's a whole nother, whole nother commercial. I mean, we can record one of those here. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> so you can, and you can put it on your iPod or your MP3. Yeah, you can take it with you and you can play it on your computer. But wow. the great thing is um, it, sign up is totally for free. The other great thing is that it does help support Freedom Train, which we Love Support you for that. Freedom Train. So please. yeah, check out audiblepodcast.com slash freedom train and get your free 14 day trial. Check it out, y'all. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, hey, technical difficulties, stuff happens, but you know, we're gonna keep it moving. So life can be so nice. Uh, as I started to say, I wasn't really feeling this track initially. It was too busy, it was just too much stuff going on. I, I couldn't really understand where he was going with it. But once again, uh, you know, after a certain point, you just I let it play. And I knew the song by heart, and it's not that I hated it. It's just that it wasn't really doing anything for me. Years later, I finally start to hear some of the uh, live stuff of this period. And that's when I fell in love with this song because, you know, like he always does, when they take it to the stage... I feel like they have more time to flesh out these songs and really, you know, bring out the stronger points of the of the music and fine tune them. And I then I, I was like, whoa, I heard it live and I went back and listened to the album version. And there was parts in the album version that I wasn't hearing before because I didn't know them. Well, after I heard it live, I went back and I could hear those different breaks and the stuff with the drums. And I was like, oh, this is dope. Like, you know, so that's my uh, history with this cut. But, it, you know, it is a classic. Um, uh, sexy and sack. You use the word thrown 
in your in your review, and I have to agree completely because that's what this sounds like to me. It's very almost chaotic. You know, it's like everything else was very smooth and had a you know definite direction, and this one is like just throwing some paint on the wall and seeing what we get. I'm not saying it's bad, and I and I know the words myself, but it's not you know one of my favorites. I mean, it's kind of just I don't know, just kind of breaks the flow, and not in a in a positive way for me. It just Boom, you know, you hear the little, I think it's a, a flute that, is it a flute or a pickle? Don't, don't laugh at that. <laughs> you know, I don't know what that thing is, and the drums are just so crashing, I'm like, no, nah, I just, it, it doesn't work for me. Interesting. And, of course, and, and, and you know, I also add to that, Sheila E playing uh, on the drums, but, uh, uh, Big Ken, go ahead. Well, I actually like it, man. I, I kind of figured we'd disagree on this one. Um, I, I'll admit, like you, Mike, when I first heard it, I was taken aback by it because it, it was a lot to, to uh, ingest at the time. But at the same time, it didn't take me nearly as long as you did to get into it. I mean, because the way I look at it, this song is, is very funky, but it's different than what you would expect. Because this track has always struck me as being just an experimental track. This is like you, pretty much what you said, Big Sexy. They, they were in the studio just trying some stuff out. A lot is thrown into it. To me, it's kind of similar in vain to, to It's a Wonderful Day, although I think It's a Wonderful Day sounds a little bit better and probably would have worked better here in this spot. But it's still the same type of track. Um, and to me personally, I like how it builds into to that level of chaos and then it suddenly cuts out to the serenity of, of Venus de Milo. I do think one thing, you know, the one problem with this song is, and, and we've discussed this before on a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of Prince albums. The main problem with this song is, I think the way it sounds, the way it sounds is partly due to the fact the way it's mixed. You know what I'm saying? There's so much in it. It's like there's no separation in the sound field. So I know what you're saying, Mike. Everything is just kind of like just, just you know, mashed together. Mm -hmm. So it is hard to discern what Prince is saying in some areas, and, and I think that has a lot to do with how it was mixed and mastered, but, you know, we had that problem with a lot of the Prince albums. You know, he's never liked how his albums were mixed anyway, so. But overall, I mean, it's, to me, it's a, a bomb track. It took, took a little bit to, to get into it, uh, but I, I like it. You know, it's it's very unique song. Uh, you know, it's an acquired taste, I guess. All right, they dropping. Interesting that you guys mentioned about the mix on there. This is uh, a track that whenever I'm playing it loud, uh, or, you know, I'm playing the album loud. When I get to this track, I have to lower it down because it's just a lot of stuff hitting me. And it's it's at, at, at a loud level, it's just, it's kind of messy. Lower it down, it's it's much better and all. But yeah, it's a trip that you guys mentioned that. Um, for me, you know, and this is this is the thing with, with the four of us, sometimes we just do not agree on stuff. I, I think this is an awesome track. Um, it's all over the place, so chaotic, more chaotic, but similar in uh, in the chaos to uh, in a large room with no light from this era, not the jazzy one. Um, and I find it interesting that this is one of the few, what I consider, you know, like those transition type of songs. Uh, I know you guys, you guys dig them, and I usually don't. Where where it'll start with one style and then in the middle of the song it kind of changes up tempo a little bit and and you guys are digging those and I tend to not like those. This is one where it does that a little bit, and I like that. I think it works on this one. Um, and uh, again, I see this one whether it is or it isn't. It sure does feel like it. And another one of those Prince, Lisa, and Wendy compilation type of tunes. And um, one of the things that I've always dug on it, the way it just abruptly ends mid note at the very end it's it's just like you got kicked the nuts or something you know it's it's man i i just dig that and then to find out that it was sheila that was doing the, the percussion on it whew, even more so so yeah you know um i i dig this track i always have uh you know and for whatever reason i liked it when i first heard it i don't don't know why and it just grew on me more and more as the more i would hear it and Oddly enough, scoring this one, I'd have to. Well, not oddly enough. I mean, this is this is my my flavor of craziness. I had to give this one a ten. Believe it or not. All right. All right. Another ten. Next up is 
Venus de Milo. And uh, Big Sexy and Sack. It's on you. I love it. Love it. You know, I wish it was longer. If I played it then and now, I just want it to be longer. It's beautiful. It's perfect piano playing. Again, this was another piece that if he put in his piano set on tour, I'm going to go ahead and steal from Ernie. The painters will be dropping. Because this is such a great <laughs> instrumental. <laughs> I love it. You know, I, I got <laughs> Isn't that trademark <laughs> infringement? Isn't that trademark infringement, man? <laughs> I, I bought it. I bought it. I'll, I'll send him a royalty. You know? Okay, <laughs> okay. Just check it. You know, but this, this is a great piece of music. I just wish it was a lot longer. I mean, he could have stretched this out for me seven or eight minutes. I would have been very satisfied with it. As it is, it's great, but it's just not long enough, but it's still a great, great piece. All right, Big Ken. Yeah, I agree. It, it's a, a beautiful song, although I do think that it was short, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's short by design because it provides a nice break in the action and it, it provides a cap for the end of side one. As you recall, this was the end of the first side of the LP or the cassette. You know, sure. kind of like the calm before the storm, before all the funk comes on the second side. And and I love the uh, the, the trumpet work uh, by who I assume to be Atlanta Atlanta Bliss playing. Uh, I'm not sure, but I would assume that's him playing. But whoever it is, it's very very nice. Just a, a beautiful song, a nice way to end the first side. All right, they dropping. Um, more of the same. It's a beautiful track. Always dug the song. It's, it's so melodic. It's the beginning there's some songs that you just know from the very beginning and this is one of them just from those low piano tones that come out at the very beginning it's it's undeniable um and i agree in that it's only flaw is that it's not longer uh even by a minute or two longer a little bit more would have just been great on it i understand that it, it is the the ending of it and i think that's that's where it kind of suffers in this digital age now and that you can hear the whole thing, the whole album from beginning to end, and you cannot, dis- and we've talked about this before, you can't uh, physically stop and, you know, flip the tape and put it around and, and or get a breather, you know, okay, I'm done with side one, I'm go do what I got to do and listen to side two, because I now ended on a calm note and everything. Uh, you, you don't get that nowadays. But then, yes, as Big Ken said, um, when I had to flip the, tr- the tape over, I was given a a nice ending to side one with this track and it's beautiful, beautiful as it is. I really wish it was a little bit longer. Um, and it, it, it's a, a great ending to the end of side one. Uh, and it, only because I need it, I need it to be longer. That's just my personal opinion. I need it to be longer. So it, it's one shy of the perfection and it's a nine out of 10. Beautiful, beautiful song. All right. Um, <clears throat> This this is interesting to me, like, because I had this on vinyl, and I think I've had uh, all of them were on vinyl. I don't think I had the only ones I really had on tape were Purple Rain and Controversy for whatever reasons. But the problem I had back then was my record player would act funny sometimes, and so a lot of the early print stuff from this period, I always remember them playing with skips because that's how my record player would play. <laughs> So, so unfortunately, like this song, there would be it would start to skip sometimes, and it took me years until I finally got, either I got the cassette or I got it on CD, where I really just got to play without the skips. And this is one of his most brilliant pieces of music, period, across the catalog. It's not the best, but I'm just saying, like, if you had to pull, you know a smorgasbord of across the career, this would have to be included. Uh, I was just reading on this as we were talking about it. You know, this song actually uh, existed before this project uh, even came about. It says it was just an untitled uh, piano piece he had for years. And uh, he actually recorded this song and uh, with, with Alexi de Paris uh, to get, you know, at the same point, him and Sheila were together. Uh, and they were in, I think they were in, uh, no, it just says that, yeah, they did this. And so I'm just like, man, it's very short, and it just gives you a little peek of, like, 
he could have went into a whole different direction just on a you know a side project, and I wish they did, and maybe they did, and we haven't heard this yet, but you know songs like this, Alexia de Paris, I mean, if he would have just had one album and that could have been Smart House instead of Madhouse or something, that would have been so ridiculous, like it just shows how creative this and how masterful he was where he can just drop a little piano joint because nobody was doing that as far as being, you know, a pop artist and that type of thing. I mean, he was being so art. art. He was doing art. The difference between a guy that's doing art and a guy that's artistic, you know, and I remember back in the days, we all, it was always a debate between Jesse Johnson and Prince. With, with, with respect to Jesse Johnson, that's a ridiculous comparison when you really look at it because... Prince was doing art where, you know, yeah, it's going to take me a minute to get into it because it ain't what I want. It ain't what I know. But with Jesse, he was just giving you straight Minneapolis funk. It's, that was artistic, but he's going, he's following a, a, a set pattern. And so this just goes to show me, you know, how Prince was going off the pattern. He was creating some other stuff that was challenging. And, I, you know, for an artist of his caliber to do something like this, I just to me it's just ah even today this still this blows away anything he's done piano wise since then period to me like I mean just on that level and the way he was playing like that piano album they had years ago I wanted him to be I wanted that album to be like this to have yeah. this sound you know and uh, and, I, and I, I hate to compare yeah, him I like agree. that but it's just like this is that piano print sound that I know I really long for. So anyway, just a tangent on that. Uh, so we're going to flip over the vinyl. We're going to turn over the cassette. And we're going to go to mountains. And I will say this for Mr. Michael Dean. I was not feeling mountains when it first came out. Okay, show's over. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I was Keep not lit. feeling this at all. I would act, It was a part because it was skipping part because I just, I don't know, it felt dry to me. It just felt dry. I couldn't, again, I, it was hard to understand the lyrics. Because, you know, he, to me, like, and D'Angelo does this to the highest level of, you know, absurdity but it seems like he's blurring the stuff together or he's not, he's not insensitating, uh, I can't say, I can't even say it. It's not, He's not, you know, enunciating. enunciating, excuse me, which he doesn't have to, but it was just kind of frustrating to me and I couldn't understand what they were saying. And it was just different sounds. You know, he's being very uh, adventurous with it. Now, let me also state, when the 12-inch drops, <laughs> it's a whole different ball game. It becomes the most brilliant track and the funkiest track. See, I, when I heard it on the record... It was not really funky to me. Like I was just like, ah, what is he doing? Like, g give me this stuff. That twelve inch is freaking ridiculous. And I'll say this, and then I'm gonna stop. And we just said this about a lot of the songs in here. The one problem with this this song is that it should have been longer uh, with a lot of them. But it, this really, to me, should have been. If they couldn't have put the whole thing that they did on the 12 inch, I can understand that, but at least a little bit more. And actually, I think there's a guitar part that it was taken out as well on the release version, which I don't understand that. But uh, uh, at the initially listening to this album back then, I, I, I would skip this one every time. Um, but wow. it, but of course, the 12 inch drops, I would have swapped them out in a minute and then that would have been my, my cut. So, anyway, Big Ken, go ahead. Wow. Well. All I can say, man, is that, you know, I've, I've dug this track from Jump, uh, super funky. Uh, actually, Fierce is more accurate to me, I, I, you know, especially when you take into consideration the full version that you just mentioned. Great lyrics, uh, to me, with a very memorable chorus, you know, that you'd end up humming, you know, long after you heard the song, to which, which to me is a mark of a good song. It's, it's still in your brain long after you listen to it. And I love the video, too. I thought the video was real cool. I mean, yeah, it was low budget, black and white and everything. But, you know, I thought it was cool because, it, at least to my knowledge, that was the first time that you really got to see the, quote-unquote, expanded revolution on screen for the most part. 
uh, including Wally and Brooks and all those, all those the, the, the little review and whatnot. Not to mention my girl Wendy looking good, sitting on the piano in that little flimsy sheet that she had on with her back all out playing the guitar. Mm-hmm. <laughs> anyway, musically, the track to me had uh, you know more bottom than the stuff on the first side, which was immediate. And, and this, to me, I thought it was a great choice to start the second half of the album. And, and now, unlike you, Mike, I actually, you know, I agree. The way they fade the song out, you know, they fade it out too early, which is a, a common complaint we have with a lot of these older Prince albums. But to my ears, when they fade it out, you can hear them getting ready to go off in another direction. So my thing was like, man, I just want to hear you know, the rest of it. So, like you said, when the 12-inch drops, I'm just like, okay, I'm just like, wow, this is just simply ridiculous. But I dug the track from Jump, man. I thought it was excellent. I thought it was a strong start to the second side. All right. Day dropping. I'm going to use Big Ken's word on this one because it's perfect. The song is fierce. It is. Um, it don't get funky until the 12-inch kicks in. Right when this fades out, that's when the funk begins. And for that reason, I it suffers for not having the 12 inch version on here or a derivative of the 12 inch, some kind of mix that allows you to hear some of that fun coming in, at least a minute or two of it, because that 12 inch kills it. You're right, but it is fierce track nonetheless. Um, some good clearfish strings going on in this one as well. Again, it only suffers from not being longer, and maybe that's the constraints of the vinyl or the or the cassette don't know but uh the good thing about the digital format is that we can put together our own mix of it and we can put those 12 inches on there instead of the original edits and i've done that with this album put other stuff on it as well and it's it's a beautiful album um yeah this is this is a great track though and mike it was interesting that you mentioned this i remember back in the day just one of those things that I would do, you know, I mean, I, I had to, I don't know if the album had the lyrics on it or not, just leaving the albums or what, but the cassette didn't, it just had some really cool artsy pictures on the inside and stuff. And, um, I was looking for the lyrics and I couldn't do it. So I had to make up my own lyrics on it. And I made up some <laughs> horrible lyrics for these things. So, and I remember I had a little typewriter my dad got me and I had a little, you know, four by six sheets of paper that I put in there and I would type up the lyrics, you know, just, for the heck of it, spend the afternoon listening to it. It's a rainy day afternoons listening to the CD, putting the lyrics down on paper. And man, I came with some atrocious stuff. Uh, Mountains was was not spared, and I wish I had those because it, it, it was some funny stuff that I remember now. That I little bitty things that I remember. It was pretty funny, but yeah, um, it, lyrically I, I didn't know what he was saying all the time. I know what he's saying now. Not that I understand it one hundred percent. I don't care because. Musically, it's great. It's a great track. Again, it just suffers from not being the 12 inch. So, on that basis, it um, it gets a score of eight out of ten. And I'll say one thing about the scoring: none of these tracks go below an eight. It tells you how strong that album is. All right. And I, I, before I go to uh, Big Sexy and Sack, you know, you talk about the lyrics. <clears throat> I, I, the, I, you know, on the album version, if I'm not mistaken, there were no lyrics printed, which I thought was. No sucked but uh you know like this song you know even to this day i still do this even though i've seen the lyrics now but you know i always was like um and i excuse my voice but i'm like uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's like i could make a one word <laughs> like and he's saying nothing i just you know and that's all i would do like i was like i don't know what the hell he's saying but you know whatever even uh, still, that's not as bad as, like you mentioned, uh, D'Angelo is terrible at that, man. You can barely yeah. make out his words. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. But you I know... Listen so- to, never listen to Dev- was it Devil's Power. Uh, what's the song? Uh, oh, Devil's, Devil's Power. Pie, whatever. Uh-huh. Man, I can't understand a word he says. Off the fire. Oh, the fire. Jesus Christ. That's what he said. Yeah, yeah, you could have called you. You could have told me what he said. <laughs> <laughs> on the song, in my own life, in devil's pie. That's the only part yeah, of that's, devil's that's, pie. That's pretty much it. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> All right. Uh, big Sexy and Sack, man. Uh, well, as far as, you know, lyricists who you can't understand, my personal favorite is Michael McDonald. You know, I have no clue what he's saying, <laughs> but I digress. That's true. Um, I think, I thought this was like the perfect single, and this is the perfect song that I would use back then 
to hit people to what he's what Prince was doing. Because like if they heard this, they 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 could say, okay, that sounds like Prince. Whereas if you play him Electric to Paris or Christopher Tracy, they're like, what, what the hell is this? So I play them this to get them into the album and then let the album speak for itself. Uh, I do remember the video. Remember seeing Brooks and Stafford, who still to this day get on my nerves with that damn hat. But, you know, other than that, Wendy was looking right. 12 inches, though, that's the killer. That's the killer. Oh, that's now, you hat. know you got that hat somewhere, Big Sexy. Come on, now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a great song. Uh, again, 12, 12 inch version is the definitive one. And other than that tour, if he can play this, I don't think he's played this a lot live. And when you have a band that solid, you need to let them stretch out. You know, let them go out there and play what they do. And he, he really didn't take advantage of that with this song. Yeah, I don't really, I can't remember too many instances of this song live. Uh, all I can say is, you know, in that 12, it's not a review of the 12 inch version, but as they go on in there, to me, for me, that's actually my favorite 12 inch because they just get the horns are so ridiculous. And the little for breaks and things they're doing, and the, the the to the last part where they do that bass, it's, uh, that it's just I don't understand how you don't put that on the record. But anyway, it has been released, so we'll keep it moving. The next one, do you lie? You ain't got the lie, Craig. This, um, I again, I loved, I loved this initially because it was so different. But it is so ridiculously funky and just like slinky. And just, uh, the, there's the part later on. I kind of forget how it goes right now. But uh, the juxtaposing of his vocal and the, the the female background vocals, that's some ill vocal work right there. I mean, the harmonies and this. The ah oh, man, that's they was killing it on this. And I was so sprung on just the sound of his voice on this. He just sounded like such a cool mother sucker on this, man. Like, I was like, and I, I was thinking, when I would play this before I saw the movie, I was like, this is what the movie's going to be about. Like some, I mean, some pimp, pimpish type shit was on that French, that other kind of shit, but he was still Prince. And he was like, this is smooth. Like, do you really love Oh, when you... You know that, and he's talking this. I was like, "Oh, this is." Oh, I was just like, "This is some Mac vibe." This, I don't even know what the hell he's saying, but it sounds so smooth. <laughs> I'm like, you know how you had them old men's like, "Ah, baby, I'm talking French." You know, you know. That's why I was like, but it was just a <laughs> tripped out version of that. <laughs> but anyway, I love this song, man. This song does not get enough burn. I don't know if they've ever done this live. Like, if somebody's got that, you need to email me immediately at mdean206 at gmail.com because I need to hear this, <laughs> man. So, uh, they drop and I go to you. Yeah, you know, man, this this is a full on pimp Christopher Tracy Prince style going on here in the song here. It is so smooth. It's so cool the way he does that. And as, you know what, man? My favorite, my favorite tone of voice that he does on this is at the very end. Man, when when he just he just gets all cutesy and all the women out there, you know what was that lyric that he said at the very end? Uh, the, the the way he speaks the very last lines of the song, man, it always does it for him. I'm like, yeah, that's right. <laughs> you sing that way, some girl, man. She gonna be they gonna drop. And man, this track is just it's 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 an awesome track. I, I love how how the girls at the beginning in French going right along with what he what pretty much the song's about, saying you know children who. Who lie, don't go to paradise. And that's beautiful, the, the way that works out. It's a whimsical song, yet it sounds kind of like 30-ish, 20s, 30s type of style to it, man. And, and it works. It works. You can totally, totally envision um, Christopher singing this. And he does to a degree in, in, in the movie. And, and the way he does it is the way you can imagine him singing the whole song in front of a piano, you know listening to some some dude leaving a voicemail for whatever reason leaving a voicemail and saying me too and that type of stuff on there and man it's it it, it takes you to a different place when you listen to this type of song and I've always I've always dug it yeah that that whole harmonizing like you were talking about 
uh, when he starts singing the lyrics going down, going down, going down, and then the girls are singing behind them, it works. It's always worked. It's beautiful. This is a good track, an excellent track, and it, it's uh, another personal favorite of mine. Um, this one is easily um, 10 out of 10. All right. Big Sexy and Sack. Sir, Big Sexy. Oh, we might have lost him. Big Ken. Yeah, this is, uh, I, I got to agree with you guys, man. This this is an excellent song. You know what, um, Ken? Hold, hold yeah. on. Hold on one second. We're not going to edit this. We're going to keep this live like this, but we're going to get my man back on here, and then we'll go right back to you. But I don't want this to ring while you're talking. So, uh, well, sing the song until he gets back. I want to <laughs> There you go. Do you really? It's kind of like some little Elvis. Are we doing Elvis? <laughs> no, I was doing some intermission music while you was coming back. All right, okay. so uh, Big Kim, I'm sorry. Go ahead, sir. Oh, I was just saying this is a, an excellent, excellent song, man. It, it's another one of those tracks that initially when I first heard it, I was floored. You know, and it it took a second for me to just register what I was hearing. But one common thought just kept running through my head in the background. I, I never forget it because I, I remember vividly thinking this. And I'm like, man, who else in the world would put something out like this but Prince? Who else is even capable of this? And this, this, this songs like this just, just further solidify, you know, my allegiance to his music. You know, and when anybody would come up. You know, with some type of argument about it, I would I would throw stuff like this, like, oh, "Can your man do this? Can your boy do this?" No, then shut up, huh? Yeah. You know, and that's just how I felt. <laughs> I mean, I, I wasn't even really deep into jazz at that point in time, but I was aware of it, and so I immediately, you know, uh, recognized the the light, uh, airy kind of jazzy vibe that this song has, and for me, it's now listening to it. It sounds like something you would hear in the 50s, you know what I'm saying? It sounds like mm -hmm. something you might hear Ella Fitzgerald singing or somebody like that singing it. And I just, like you guys, I just thought Prince was just super, super cool, man. Just suave all the way through from, from, from beginning to end, the way he delivers those lines, you know. And, and his vocal range on this is really good, too. He's not singing in his normal, he sings some of it in falsetto, but then he also goes into a little bass, you know, toward the end. So it's just real nice. It's just a great song. One of my personal favorites on this record. Yeah, let me just add real quick before we go to a uh, big sexy. We got to give honorable mention, praise to Jonathan Melville because he is more so a collaboration between the two on this particular song. Uh, he he plays the drums on this song. He's playing keyboards, uh, and it's just interesting to see, you know. That they can do some pretty good stuff together, uh, him and uh, Prince. So you got to give him his props. But uh, we'll keep it moving to Mr. Big Sexy and Sack. Just so I'm clear, we're doing. Uh, do you do lie? lie? Yes, sir. Well, to me, when I hear that song, it reminds me of Kim Miller. It reminds me of Meek Strand. You know, it just captures that whole vibe to me. And. Everything about it, I like it. So kind of, I kind of got thrown off because of a little technical issue here. But I'm hearing it in the back of my mind now. And it does sound a lot like something you could hear on a torch finger, like Elephant Gerald saying, and things of that nature. It's very understated, but very well assembled. And I love it. As much as, as, much as I didn't really care for why it be so nice because of, the, because of it being so disorganized, I like this for that same reason, because it's something different that, you know, you're not, like, like Kim said, you're not hearing this, you know. Well, I like Rick James. Rick ain't doing this. Or I like Salto. They're not doing this. You know, this is him taking a chance on something brand new and just completely left of, of center, and I think he pulled it off very well. And this is something that he could give to another vocalist or female vocalist and just let her really work it out. This is a great piece of music. Yep, yep, art, art, art. All right, we're going to go to the next one, which is Kiss. Uh, the song Kiss, of course, the first single. Uh, this song is, don't even really have to say, we all know this is a classic 
song. You don't even have to be a Prince fan. You know this song. You know the words. It is a it is a piece of pop culture, period. You know what I'm saying? Um, but what's interesting about this song, obviously, is the you know the the, the story behind the song, and uh, you know how it came to be. Um, briefly, this was a song Prince did uh, as an acoustic version for the Paisley Park group Maserati, and he was you know giving them some songs that they could record. He just did this song very quickly, you know, on a guitar, and it's like, okay, here you guys go, you know, y'all, y'all can do something with that. Uh, they go back into the studio with, uh, was it David Rifkin? Yep. Uh, I'm make, yep. Okay. Make sure I get that right. They go back in the studio with him and they add drums and, uh, pretty much everything that you hear in the release, aside from the guitar stuff, they, they add all, you know, they create the sound of the song, you know, they, they pretty much produce the sound that we hear and they do vocals and they cut it, you know, it's like, whoa, okay. And then Prince goes back, he hears their version, he's like, oh, okay, actually, I think I'm going to need that song back, you know what I'm saying, let me, let me, let me see something about this, and I think if, if the story is, you know, if my memory is correct, he actually takes it that night and does, puts, you know, go ahead and put the purple, uh, purple jerry juice on top of it, put some, politi- you know, purple politics, and the next morning, you know, we got that smash that we all know. And, you know, forever a, a classic Prince song. But I just, it was always a trip to me when I heard the story. I was like, you just assume that nobody else could touch that song but Prince. But it's interesting that actually, you know, he's not 100% the producer on this. You know, he he took, them guys came up with the drums and all the sound and the harmony and stuff. And then he, you know, waxed it off with his genius. It's a no-brainer. Uh, I'm curious to hear what the rating is on this from Day Dropping. But uh, anyway, so that's Kiss. Uh, I w- and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this and then I'll move forward somebody else. I do feel that this song is complete the way it is on this record. I don't feel like it's too short. Even though there is a 12-inch version, it's obvious on the 12-inch version that the stuff that they're doing was added after the fact and wasn't recorded like that. Um, the only thing that's always was a trip to me about this song is the ending of this song because there's like two different endings. There's the video ending, you know, and the guitar is one way, and then there's the ending that's on this record. And that, that always kind of tripped me out f- f- why they are why they were different. I never could understand why, and maybe somebody would enlighten my black ass. All right, next up is Big Ken. Go to work. You yeah. know, well... And pretty much, I got to agree with pretty much everything you said, man. I mean, it's a classic masterpiece. You know, Kiss is the stuff of legend, man. You know, the story you broke down behind it, you know, the story behind the thing, it's, it's all it's all well noted. To me, man, this song is the prototype of, of minimalist funk, man. I mean, it's just guitar and drums. That's it. That's all. That's the list. And when you think about it, I mean, it's pretty bold, man. I mean, you know, granted, you know, he might, it might not have been a full, complete, Prince production, you know, he had production assistance like you just mentioned. But regardless of all that, man, you think back to 86, man, even to 2010, man, not too many folks would even attempt something like this, man. I mean, they wouldn't even talk about trying to do something like this because it just breaks too many musical rules, man. It just breaks too many rules. I mean, you know, he's done this before with other songs, you know, like When Doves Cry and and other tracks where, you know, it's, He's bending the rules, but I mean, come on, it's unheard of in most for the most part, man, to not have any bass line, you know, you know, you got to have some type of, you know, uh, keys in, in there it's, at some point. None of that, man. It's just guitar, drums, and the vocals, and, and it's perfect as, as is. I just remember, man, this being played all the time back in the, in the day when it dropped, and I just recall the feeling, as we all alluded to at some point during this show, you know, the, the expectation and waiting to hear the new Prince, you know, single, you know, you know the album is coming and you're waiting to hear this single and then you finally hear this, this drops on the radio and you hear it, I, I'm like just flabbergasted. I'm like, oh my God, it's like a bomb drop. You know, I was just stunned. There was nothing even remotely close to sounding like this out of the time. And hell, it ain't nothing remotely close sounding like this today, for that matter. 
So bottom line, you know, like you said, man, it's a, it's a classic, a signature track known pretty much by everybody everywhere for good reason. And even though it was probably added on after the fact, to me, that, that full version, that 12-inch version is just insane. So much so that I basically replaced the album version with that in, in my playlist, man. I can't listen to Kiss now unless it's that full version, or that long version, man. It's just I have to, you know, hear that boy cut your hair. I got to hear that, man. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a masterpiece. Uh, yeah. It is what it is, a masterpiece. All right. Uh, big Sexy and Sex. You know, back then when I first heard this song, it reminded me of Dirty Mind's Controversy Era because it was so stripped down. And then I see the video, and I'm like, okay, there's Wendy. Where the hell is everybody else? You know? It was, it was can't use the word minimalist, and that's what this was for me. And I thought it was a fun little song, and it really started to grow on me. And I noticed how, I, as I walked through camp, it grew on everybody else. Clearly, this was a big hit, but it really didn't resonate for me until I saw it done live. When I saw it done live, I'm like, okay, now we're talking here. And every time I see him do it live, it's done a little differently. Uh, like off the top of my head, the standout version for me at this second is on the Raven to the New Year DVD. You know, as much as I've with Larry in the past, they put it down on that version. They really did. And I know that the song was recorded without a bass track, so maybe that's what's missing live and when Mark or Larry or whoever fills in. It just blows up. But I will never get tired of this song. It's just one of those songs that's just etched in pop culture. In fact, when he does it now, he'll take the Dynasty reference out and put in Sex in the City. So it's always updatable. And I just think this song is, is perfect. Perfect. Yeah, this is a perfect hit single, period. And I just want to like, jump in real quick because just a you know, friendly competition debate. <laughs> I'm just joking. Uh, the, the funny thing to me about the live version, I always thought, that the live versions did not do the song justice. And it, I actually felt like the most best, the best live performance of the song I ever heard was on the Arsenio Hall show. Uh, you know, when he's the Diamonds and Pearls era. To me, that was the first time I ever heard it live where I was like, he nailed it. Because even when you, to me, like the um, parade tour version, like that video that the Detroit. A video, home video that they didn't put out, but you've seen it. I I thought it was like almost terrible because I just like it's, it was missing something. And I don't think they couldn't get the flow of the song right or they didn't use the drum machine or something. I just always thought it was very bad. And, and I was never disappointed when, well, I was disappointed that I never saw them do it in concert. Well, I actually, actually I did. I love Sexy, but I just never felt like they got the funk of the record, which was odd uh, because everything else was better than the record. But that was the one song I always felt like they never was able to nail it until I saw Arsenio. So I just thought it was interesting that you said that, you know. But everybody has a different take on it. Actually, he always does it a different way out of every tour, too. He always changes something up in it mm -hmm. and take with it, and which, is, which is fine. It's his song. But I can definitely see where you're coming from, though, with that reference. All right, so they drop him. Drop him. Well, you know, to, to add a little bit to, to that story, the background story behind it, you know, and um, to add to uh, possibly why it, it, it gets changed around, my, my understanding is that he, he it was in one of the last tracks on, on the album, recorded on the album, and that it, it was something that he, he took it, he, he played with it and did his thing, but he was never fully content with the way it came out. And that was the driving reason for such a change up every time he performs it live or in concert or you know, on a show or something. It, it always it's always different because he's never been content with the way the song came out. Uh, and it's probably why you you won't likely hear a live version of the album version, if you follow me on that. You won't hear the album style when you hear it live because he just hasn't been really content with it. The track itself, though, um, yeah, it was a, the lead-off single and it was funky. I mean, that, that was that was one of the songs you heard back in summer of 86. Um, the video was, was, was awesome for it because it was so minimalistic and you had a good eyeful of, of Wendy on that one. 
I'm sure Big Ken enjoyed that one all too well. Um, <laughs> as a lead track, though, for me, it was ultimately quite deceiving because it was so different from the rest of the album. You know, it was like when you see that, um, uh, uh, like a like a preview, like a trailer for a movie, you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, and then you go and watch the movie, and it really wasn't all that great. It's like watching the, the trailer to Clash of the Titans 2010, and you go watch, and it wasn't all that. Now... That said, in other words, what you see out of the, the preview is not what you get necessarily. Now, it doesn't mean that the album was bad, but it was different. It gave you an initial different vibe from the single than what you got from the album. So that's going to, to me, that, that worked negatively on this. And although I like the track, it's one that I don't really listen to much. I guess I'm just kind of played out on it. I don't listen to that just like I don't listen to Purple Rain. I know, gasp from everybody. I don't really listen to Purple Rain, the song, because I don't care much for it. It's been played out too much for me. But uh, Kiss is another one of those. Um, and I believe it could have been better had it been somehow placed, replaced with the 12-inch and to some degree, if not fully. Um, because of that, because of those two things. One, it doesn't really um, fit with the feel of the rest of the album. That's one knock right there. And because I believe it should have been replaced with the 12-inch, just to be able to hear them do uh, Sal, just hear him do Sal and his wife at the end. Um, should have been replaced with that one. That's two knocks on there. It has to be no greater than an eight. Absurd. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. All right. We gonna, we, we, I got to catch flex. Get into that. the wrap-up. But All right, so the next track is um, Another Lover Holding Your Head. Uh, I'm going to say mine real quickly. This was a no-brainer for me. Uh, I love this song. Kiss and Another Lover Holding Your Head. I was just like, this This is that. These are the joints, you know, the, the no-brainer joints. Um, quickly, again, we mentioned this song before. It, you can hear it about to get ridiculous as it starts to fade. And that was my only problem. I was just like, ah, why? Why, 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 why stop this? This is so good. I need more and more and more. And then a few months later, they gave us more. So I'm totally happy with this song. Uh, Big Ken. Man, come on, dude. This song, man. No, I'm tripping, man. This is a crazy, crazy song. Come on now. Everybody love this. I know I know. Ernie going to give this more than eight. No pressure. I know he going to do it, though. <laughs> but uh, this is a great, great song. The bass popping. It's ridiculous, man. Okay, this is the bass popping song. Ser I mean, seriously, I mean, he, whoever's on the bass, I'm assuming it's Prince, but whoever's on the bass, they're killing it more in this song than they do in any other track in, on this record. The beat is in the pocket, very tight. The lyrics, vocals, everything works. And just like you said, Mike, you know, I was with, like you, man. It gets to the end on, on the cassette, and I'm salty because I'm like, damn it! You know, they're about to go off. But that extended version... Is off the chart crazy. It's a classic. So just like Kiss, I had to replace the album version with this one in my playlist, and it's all good. You bring the woodpecker, I'll bring the wood. <laughs> nice. <laughs> all right. Uh, day dropping. Um, nine out of ten, because because it um, I needed to put the foot on the rock. That's why. If I can't do that, then then if I was able to do that, it'd be a 10 out of 10. In other words, it needs to be longer. Uh, funky Baseline, Prince, Wendy, Lisa collaboration, full effect on this one. And um, it don't get no crazier than this. You know I mean? It, it could, but, and it should have. And that's why it's not a 10. But otherwise, great jam. Perfect. 9 out of 10. All right. Big Sexy and Sack. I got a co-sign. Uh, just like, you know, you guys said, on the on the album version, you know we're not gonna, you know we're not doing the twelve inch one, but the album version, right when it starts to fade, is when you know it's about to get nuts. And I remember when I got the twelve inch version, I threw it on my walkman. I, I sat in my public speaking class in the back doing a lecture and just acted a fool with that song. And of course, <laughs> it got yelled at. I had it coming. But again, that was a twelve inch. This song is good. It's a great single. I love the video. Once again, Susanna looking right. And Prince was bubble neck canary yellow suit. I don't know what the hell he was thinking. But <laughs> it's a great song. Great song. The 12 inch one is vastly superior because it really lets Eric and Atlanta just cut loose. And when you hear that little breakdown in that 
in the 12 inch version, you're like, okay, this is something new. And then it just, like, like Ernie said, you put your foot on the rock and just get down to it. I love it. I love it. But that's the 12 inch. This one, again, while good, very good, 12 inch is definitive. Boom, that's the one. And thank you for mentioning that part about Eric Lee's and Atlanta Bliss. Uh, I believe that the video had came out first before they put the 12-inch out. And in the video, in that live performance, they have that horn break that they do. Man, I was done when I heard that. That's when I fell in love with Eric Lee's. I was just, uh, that type of shit to me. You could give me a whole album with just them them breaks. I, I'm, that's oh, it. Amen. That's, that, that's that. Uh, I was just like, this is nuts. And then they put that on the 12-inch. Ah, you know, it's 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 horn lines like that. Uh, what's the song? Rock Hard in a Funky Place. The you know the horn thing, how it kicks off in that, and then also the horn. I want to say uh, in um, the Sign of Times movie. You can never take the place. Of your man. Yes, yes, that <laughs> stuff is just so brilliantly ridiculous. I that's why I love Eric Lee's man. That uh, can't get enough. So yeah, that 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 twelve inch. Ah, it's just magical, magical, magical. All right. Um, well, we got into the last track. Sometimes it snows in April. And uh, Big Ken. Yeah, to me, this is a simultaneously beautiful and melancholy ending to the album, uh, gracefully sung by Prince, wonderful accompaniment from uh, Wendy and Lisa on acoustic guitar and piano. I just think this is a, a haunting ballad, for lack of a better term, because it just stays with you long after you hear it, man. I mean, the melody. And, of course, once you see the film and you see, you know, the scene it is supposed to represent and all that, the lead, you know, Christopher, Christopher Tracy dying and everything, you understand it more. But it's, to me, you know, most, most records, they don't end an album like this, you know, on this type of note. So I immediately thought it was interesting that they that he would, you know, do that in this case. But it works, man. I, I love the song. It, it's grown on me a lot over the years. It's, a, it's just a, a beautiful song. All right. Day dropping. This, uh, this track is the beautiful ending to the album. It's uh, beautiful lyrics. Very personal for me. In fact, um, great instrumentation. Great delivery. Uh, I remember vividly. Two things I remember from this song. First is the very first time that I heard it and the very last uh, word spoken on it and, and it fades out with that, I guess, uh, the reverb of the piano chord. And I was I was just there just staring at the tape player and just soaking it in for a few seconds. To, and I let the tape on its own stop because I was just this, I was like mesmerized hearing this song. Just standing there, just looking at the cassette player until it stopped on its own. It it, it was so so captivating to me, and um, that's one of them. The other one, and why it's so personal for me is, I mean, I found the lyrics so so beautiful on it that I mean, I had to at the um, at the wake for my sister in law. I, when I got up and spoke, basically, I recited these lyrics. You know, I gave it proper, you know, credit due, and I recited these lyrics, you know, in her honor, because it was just so, it's, it is melancholy, but it's a beautiful melancholy, and so true, you know, uh, in, in relationships, friends, friendships, and everything, it, it's such a true, heartfelt uh, a song, and, um, and I think it's, it's, it's a fitting end. To this type of an album, an album that that sounds so different and sounds so um, uh, musically challenging, that um, it, it requires some type of ending like this. It, it's it's a perfect ending for me, and it's a perfect song, uh, as far as I'm concerned. It doesn't happen often that you get so many tens in an album that that tends to be somewhat underrated. Um, and this is another one though. It's it's ten out of ten. Undeniably. All right. Big Sexy and Sack. The word melancholy has been used about this song, you know, a couple of times. And it is very melancholy and it's very beautiful, yet very sad. And for that reason, I don't play it a lot. Because when you come off of the chaos of Kiss and, you know, holding your head, 
and you, you just take a right turn and get real heavy and real serious and talk about themes of loss, I just, it just takes me out of the mood that I'm in. You have to be in a certain mood to listen to this piece of music as opposed to the rest of the album. And to me, they don't go well together. I understand what he was doing, you know, thematically and in the film with it. But for me, it's just not something I listen to a lot because it is so, so uh, melancholy. And it just really, I don't want to say bums me out, but it just definitely makes you really start thinking about things and people you've lost and things of that nature. And sometimes that's a great thing. But sometimes, you know, you want to concentrate on more happier things too. But musically, it's very well done. And I can see why this is probably what he doesn't do a lot in concert for that very reason, because it probably is so personal and melancholy. All right. And I would just add that uh, I think this is a beautiful song. It is very sad, a very emotional song. And it's easy to get caught up in this when you hear it. Uh, I, I love his piano playing in this. I love his voice voice i mean it it just comes across you know i don't know if it's personal or not i was talking about the movie but it feels like he's really feeling the you know the story behind this just the way he you know says the words and the way he sings and then at the end you know he really he want michael he want you know you know they say go full retard he want full mj to me and what i mean by that he was kind of going on it reminded me of like the emotions you would hear like a uh, lady in my life or one of the one of the Michael Jackson songs where he sounded like he crying and shit on the record, like that's kind of where I was like, man, Prince going all in on this one, like it's kind of serious. So I always love it for that. Um, I don't know if I agree with it. I don't. I wish the, the I wish the album didn't end with this though, because it, to me it's not like a, it's like a downer. I understand though it matches the movie, um, so you know it is what it is. All right, now we're gonna do our recaps here. And we'll be up out of here. So uh, I think I'm going to start here. And I will say this about the Parade album. It's a very ambitious, funky. Um, it, it, it's, it's a very art. art it's, it's art. I, I will call it like that. And with all good art, you're not really supposed to like, you won't probably like everything initially. At least I didn't. Um, I, I would say that this album is a challenging album uh, and probably more so than the previous one in, in some regards because I think Ernie said something uh, pretty great here where he talked about Kiss and that being the first single. Uh, I think the and, and, and then of course that being one of the last songs recorded. <clears throat> I think that this album at the time, was totally misleading for what it was. And that's not a bad thing, but it's a very conceited effort, in my opinion, that they would put Kiss first. Because it is, it's everything you know about Prince, but different. But it's like nobody in their right mind would not like this song. You know what I mean? Like, that, of course that is the jam. It is, right? I mean, it almost sounds like it's easy. It's like, this is Prince I know. I mean, he's, you know, and, and it's a very literal song. You know, the guitar, the guitar is in your face. That funky guitar is in your face. His falsetto is in your face, which was another shocking thing about the song, just, just his voice like that, you know, so clear and up in your face. And then there's just the drums. Um, it, it's almost like, in a sense, musically, on some levels, it's... Um, Early, it's like what hip hop is. It just takes the best parts of James Brown or or the best part of the break, and that's the music. So it doesn't have to have, you know, the keyboards and all this other accents. It's just the actual funky part, and it's the whole entire song. And when I hear Kiss, to me, it's just like he just took the all the great parts he knows of James and some of the other soul artists, and like I'm gonna just do the whole song like that. Uh, that's what I get from that. But at the same point, if you buy the when people bought that record, you expecting more of that, it ain't on there. <clears throat> and that's not a but the record is brilliant. But I will say this that I think the album is uneven. Uh as much as I like the songs on there, 
I think that it's a little too all over the place. Um, because you have Kiss on one hand, you have Do You Lie, which is way on the other side of the, of the world. It's still brilliant, but it's just all over the place. I, I, I don't really feel that a lot of the stuff is cohesive enough. Those first four tracks, that could have been an album or released onto itself. And it all flows, and it has the highs and lows. But some of the other songs, like Mountains, this is my opinion, Mountains, um, Life Can Be So Nice. It just, uh, I don't know, it just seems too, it's not cohesive enough to me personally. Um, you know, back on the day when this came out, I would play this. I would go from, I would do New Position, I Wonder You, Girls and Boys, Kiss, Another Lover. Oh, and, and Do You Lie. And that was it. I would skip all the mother tracks. I wasn't ready to hear all those. But those, but to me, those tracks that I mentioned all would go together. Like, okay, this is, yeah. So I just think that this album is, is a piece of art that uh, you could listen to it as a whole album and it could take you on a journey. Or you can take bits and pieces off here. There are obviously songs on here that are tailor-made to be certain things. Um, Do You Lie is tailor-made to be what that is. Uh, Kiss is tailor-made to be a funk jam, uh, which, and it really has nothing to do with anything else on that record. But I will say this also, and I'll end it with this. The other problem with this album is that the songs are cut down. For whatever reasons they did that, I think it detracts from it a little bit because some of the brilliance was cut off. Um, some of these songs are actually funky workhouse blow the door down but they're truncated on the album and you miss that you know so i would say this the best configuration of this album is to swap the 12 inch versions where with the with the original versions and that is parade and i think that actually is a more uh accurate depiction of where prince was at that time musically and the band and all that, because on this, on, on live, them songs are ridiculous. So, you know, the twelve inch, the actual original recordings of those songs are ridiculous. But to edit it for this album, and I think that that kind of, if if you know that, I think it's, uh, it just takes away the brilliance. I don't really understand why they did that, but that's my review of Parade. So uh, this is not a perfect album to me. Uh, obviously, it's a sentimental album in my heart. Like, of course, you got to have Parade. It's great stuff on here. But, uh, you know, I'm going to keep it very real for myself. It ain't no... To me, this is not a no-brainer, every song is ridiculous album. I ain't going to be singing. I can't lie. I ain't... Do you lie? No. But I, this is a classic album. You got to have it. But I'm just saying, in the, the way it works, that's my opinion. There you go. Uh... Big, sexy, and sack. I gotta agree, but from 1999 up through five times, he was just in the zone. This album is un uneven a bit. And I think with, like, when we talked about uh, She Lee's first album, I think the singles, the standout tracks really stand out and really carry the things that are a little more experimental or avant-garde. Uh, I think it's great. Uh, I don't care for the sequencing because of the last song on the album. But other than that, I think it was well done. And again, like you said, everything is great, but if it, if it came out now with more capacity on a storage medium of 80 minutes, you could get those, those longer songs in there, the 12 inches, and hopefully flesh out a few more things. But this is definitely part of the essential Prince catalog. I love it, and I hope they do like a deluxe reissue one day for high-resolution players, because I think it wor it's working with that. Yeah, let me just add and throw in there as well. I think the better parade album is the family album. Like that to me it carries some of the same sort of themes, particularly like with the Claire Fisher stuff. I'm speaking on just as far as his production and as far as a full package. I actually feel like I could listen to that full album and not skip nothing. Even back then, I, I never skipped anything. I just think that's a more cohesive to this particular sound. Uh, obviously, this has some better songs than the majority of those, but I'm just saying as a, as a full-on drop the needle and let it run, that's more tighter in my opinion. But anyway, 
And and then this and to jump on the thing about the length, the thing about it is I think what they didn't want to do was have it be a double album. Because there was no yeah. time constraints back then. It was just the fact that they wasn't gonna let them press up another piece of, of vinyl. Because they could have easily did it on the cassette. <laughs> cassette could have been as long as they want, but then they weren't gonna have two different configurations. So anyway, um, Big Ken, go at me. <laughs> yeah. Well, I I agree with some of what you guys are saying, but I disagree in, in a couple of others. I mean, look, the way I look at it, this, this album is a masterpiece in my opinion, in every sense of the word. It is ambitious to use your word, but yet it's very underrated, uh, you know, at, at the same time. My only real problem with this album is just, like you said, they should not have truncated some of, some of the, you know, the, the, the tracks. If they would have put you know, all those tracks, you know, Mountains, Kiss, I Wonder You, Holding Your Head. Did they just put, play, you know, don't truncate them? Album would have been practically perfect. But aside from that, you know, to me, that's, you know, that's just a minor nitpick, especially considering that they, re, you know, released all, well, except for I Wonder You, they re, they released the 12-inch versions of all, all, that, all those other cuts. The album, to me, screams avant-garde. It, stre- it screams artistic experimentation. And, and the thing about it, is that this is such a bold venture, man. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm positive that Warner Brothers was, was probably confused as hell when he showed up with this with this album and this configuration. They probably didn't know what to make of it. But to me, that's the beauty of it. I have zero problem with with, with the selection of songs on here because to me, this what he's doing here is what all the great, great artists do, is that they are going to push the envelope regardless of whether we're ready for it or not. And when I think about it, this is 1986, man. Prince is a mega, mega star, huge at the time. You know what I'm saying? So for someone of, of his caliber, at his level, to take the risks that he took with this is a bold statement. You don't, you don't see, you very rarely see artists do that. You know what I'm saying? Because they're not willing to, to you know, to, to you know, risk what what they've already established to try to go someplace new. And that's what all the great, really great artists do. And I firmly believe that a lot of the chances that he took on around the the day really opened the floodgates and paved the way for a lot of this experimentation that he was doing here. I mean, my vent, I, I guess that, you know, since he probably knew that he had already broken the mold of what people's expectations were, uh, you know, uh, with, with around the world the day, he probably just figured, what the hell, why not just go for broke and just take it to the next level and just do what he's feeling at that time, you know, no holds barred. And that's precisely what he did, in my opinion, and even though, you know, the music on the surface between the two albums, you know, may seem different, you know, on, on the, you know, on the, on the outset, you know, except for the welcome addition to Claire, of Claire Fisher's orchestrations, to me, they're really not that far apart if you listen close enough, at least to me, they're not. But bottom line, I mean, I just think this is an excellent album. I, I listen to it often. I mean, it's, you know, it's in, uh, in my, one of my most uh, heavily played playlists on my iPod. It would have been off the charts crazy, as you guys have alluded to, if they would have included the extended versions of those songs, particularly I Wonder You, Kiss, Mountains, Holding Your Head. If they, and, and if also, me personally, I've always, especially in later years, coming to know what I know, man, if they would have included the other tracks recorded during this period, okay, I'm talking like Old Friends for Sale, All My Dreams, It's a Wonderful Day, Splash, and I believe Heaven was recorded somewhere between these two records. I mean, if that would have been just insane, you know, but that's what I part playlists are for, man. So that's how I listen to this record. I listen to it with most of the stuff, you know, the original, the suite from the album. But I'm, I'm going to put in, you know, I'm going to stick in. I, I actually stick in the, the full Claire Fisher, I Wonder You version that, you know, they played on the Red Bull Academy. Uh, the Long Kiss, Long Mountains, Long Hole in Your Head, Old Friends Will Sell, All My Dreams is all in that playlist, and it's exquisite. It's just this bliss. But nonetheless, Regardless of all that, Parade to me is an excellent album. I, I just love it sheerly for the fact, man, of, of just the kind of resolve it takes a cat to go ahead and just, you know what, put yourself out there, you know what I'm saying, on, on the musical level. That's, not, that's something that you don't see anymore. I can't think of any artist. I mean, if you guys know of some, then feel free to shout them out. I can't think of any artist now that, uh, that is bold enough to do this kind of stuff, that they just don't exist anymore. You know, especially when you and your expect, expectations of you are just so, you know, so high. So just on that alone, to me, it's Parade is a must own. It's a classic album. And to me, to me, this marks the midpoint of what I classify like his renaissance period or whatever you want to call it. Just the golden period, man, where he was just on fire. 
And I'm talking to, you know, uh, around one of the day, parade, sign the times, love sexy. To me, that span of four years, and the stuff before that was excellent, mind you, and a lot of the stuff after, after it was good as well. But that those four albums, Prince had no peer, in my opinion. Nobody, nowhere could touch him, could come close. You know, and, and I include all of that stuff, like you just said, Mike, some of that stuff that he was making is inclusive in that that he was doing. You know, the Madhouse, the family, all that is Jill Jones, all that's inclusive. So, Parade, you got to get it if you don't have it, although I doubt anybody listening to the show don't have it, but it's a must own. All right, day dropping. Yeah, you know, um, I, I talked about, you know, in the when we were talking about around the world in the day and on the last podcast that that there's that that album in itself really uh, disassociated folks and 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 it weaned out those who were serious listeners from those who were the casual listeners, and what if any if this album did anything. And as as Big Ken just talked about as well, the other ones did it even more. This offered up glue to solidify the idea that this guy was on something totally different, that he was going to take you on this kind of a ride. For those who dared to stay on the boat uh, beyond around the world in the day, when you heard this, it allowed you to be able to say, yeah, I know now that I'm going to get something different with this guy each time around, and and I'm okay with that. And um, it, it it was that glue that just allowed you to be able to feel that way about this type of this type of music. As far as the album itself goes, um, it, it it's it's a, it's a little it is a little bit uneven, but because of the fact that it's going along with the with the movie, and like I said, it kind of fleshes out the movie a little bit. It's kind of hard to keep it very even because the movie moves around as well, and. Um, <clears throat> But but it's it's still each track individually the tracks are, are strong like I said none of my scoring on it went below an eight, and that's not common for for his albums. Um, it's a must own for for anyone who seriously wants to hear uh, what Prince has done over the years and how he's changed and how he dared himself and the listeners um, to to go along with him and to change with him. It, it it's a beautiful album. It's a great album. It's good variety of songs. Uh, again, it suffers from being slightly neutered in that it doesn't have the 12 inch versions on it. Again, it, but you know, I you hit on it, Mike, as to why that would be, and it's probably true they didn't want to make a double album out of it. And it wouldn't have been a very good idea in hindsight because it sold, but it didn't sell as I don't think it would have sold enough to warrant a double album. It would have been seen as a big failure if that had happened. Uh, from a marketing standpoint and you know business standpoint, but if I had my way, yes, I would include all the twelve inch on there. It would be uh, old friends for sale, probably right after um, uh, what is it, girls and boys. Um, side two <clears throat> would not lead off with mountains. Mountains would actually move to the end, and I know it kind of contradicts me saying that. Um, uh, sometimes the snows in April is a great ending, but if I was to rework it, I would put uh, mountains at the very end, just like it is in the movie, and then you end up on a on an upbeat flow. Um, and instead, the lead off on side two would be Alexa de, de Paris, and um, you know, with that, and then the twelve inches that makes the dream album, as far as I'm concerned, for for Parade. I don't see where some of the other quirky tracks like Neon Telephone or others here with us would quite fit in there, but, you know, maybe there could be a way to do that too. But as, track, as the album stands, it's a good album. It's a, it's a challenging album, and there's nothing wrong with that, nothing wrong with being challenging. You would only get challenged further on with, uh, with the follow-up to this, which would be Sign of the Times, but that's a different story for a different day. All right. So, a very interesting album. I was just looking up, you know, what the album did. It looks like it initially sold like 1.8 million copies, which was uh, a decline from the 3 million from around the world in the day. Uh, you know, a lot of the reviews were mixed uh, when it came out. Uh, you know, a lot of people thought that, you know, it was definitely talented and... Um, has one guy says uh, Washington Post it says it's a mixed bag with only a few memorable moments. Um, some critics were I'm reading from Dance Music Sexual Romance. Um, 
So apparently, Prince didn't get all the flower power out of his system with last year's Mindbender LP. And that's the uh, <laughs> Los Angeles Times. Because this one kicks off with a march of toy soldiers featuring sawing strings, flutes, fanfare horns, and images of strawberry lemonade. You can almost taste the colors, man. Um, you know, they're still trying to compare them to the Beatles a lot here. USA Today calls it Beatles psychedelica. Um, so, it, it, you know, it, it, like you said, it's, it's a piece of art. And any piece of art, like I said, you know, art is in the eye of the beholder. So, you know, one can love it, one cannot see the vision or whatever. Uh, you know, it's just an interesting album. It was an interesting time. And, you know, Ken, you know, made a point to add, you know, there was a lot of music being recorded at this point. Uh, and the album could have been all sort of different things. Um, you know, I, I think the, the original ending of it was supposed to be All My Dreams, which would have been interesting, to say the least. Uh, but uh, there you go. So that's Parade. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll do another show where we, you know, get into the whole impact and, you know, what it meant. Um, uh, okay, because I was going to say something on that, on the yeah, reviews, but I'll hold off. Obviously, there was, the, there was a, a truncated tour. Uh, but... Well, we can talk somewhat about this tour because uh, we normally do that or the concert. Uh, see, that's why I, I would say that the, the, the concert tour, the, 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 the stage show that they had at this particular point, uh, it's not illustrated in the album. The album is its own thing and the tour is another. I feel like that tour is so much, so, so far superior to the recorded versions of those songs, like I almost wish that it, they took a little more time to to put the album out and make let's just all learn these songs first and then commit that as the album. And and you can say that with a lot of Prince's stuff because obviously he records in the moment and you know that recording is the song and where then after they've had rehearsal times and the band can get involved and they add more ideas those songs be turn into even just hyperdrive right but sometimes I, I feel like if they just took a little more time with some of the stuff on this particular record I, just, I don't know it could have been or maybe it's, it's just a matter of making them longer like like we said before uh it, it just would have been i think a, a buster a head a head certified head buster um but what do you guys think of the stage show? Obviously, it was a, a whole new turning point for the revolution. Uh, Big Sexy and Sack. Uh, I don't know, man. I kind of I lost the flow. What was the last part you said? <laughs> I said, what do you think about the, the, um, the stage show that they had at this time? Oh, wow. Now, now like we talked about you know, before, uh, when this tour or lack thereof, we just started to cook. I was up here in Sacramento, and he had played a show in San Francisco, which I missed because I didn't know about it. And I didn't really see any footage from this until I saw a couple things online, and then, you know, I got a copy of the, pre of the preview show for it. And the first thing I noticed was that he had Brown Mark standing behind Jerome and those two knuckleheads. I'm like, well, where the hell is Mark? And having read that Wendy and Lisa didn't really care for the more review aspect of the show, you could see a little bit of the tension, and that could be why it really didn't run as a full-scale tour and reach here. So I believe it ended in September in Japan of 86, and they just knew that that, that was it, that you know, the whole deal, deal was over. And, in fact, Wendy and Lisa had tried to quit before then because they were tired of uh, Brooks and Stafford because they didn't really bring shit to the band. And so having all that drama, and I don't want to blame Brooks and Stafford at all, but you bring those non-musician elements into, you know, three highly talented musicians, something's got to give, you know. And, the, and we talked about this, how something similar happened with, you know, Tony M and his bullshit. You know, so that's part of what happened there because you bring in these different elements who don't speak that musician language and are really more just there for window dressing, if anything. And I can see why it really started to fall apart at that point. Okay. Um, I, I got some things to say now, but I'm going to go to Big Ken first. 
Yeah, I mean, obviously I, I didn't get a chance to catch him in tour during this time. So, all the, you know, my only frame of reference were what I saw in the videos and, you know, what I saw later online. And, yeah, it, I, wish, I wish I could have seen that, that show. I thought the tour would have been, would have been great. Uh, although I, I could see the whole uh, tension that, that Big Sexy is talking about later watching it online, man. You know, I could imagine that would have been tough to deal with, too, you know, if you had this band that's been intact for so long and you add these, these uh, non-contributing cats to it, you know, I could see that would probably mess up the flow a little bit. But, uh, you know, from what I saw, the tour was hot, man. I, I wish I could have seen it. Yeah. I, you know, the first times that we saw this new revolution, this new Prince, the first time, you know, before the album came out, there was a couple things, notable things. Uh, I think the first one was the Romance 1600 uh concert on MTV, which is the home video. And, you know, he comes out and destroys the stage. We've talked about that ad nauseum. I love Bizarre. Uh, that, you know, that's a monster performance. Uh, the Sheridan, Wyoming uh, MTV premiere party and Prince and Revolution take to the stage at the end of that. Headbuster performance. I had that on repeat on my VHS over and over after school, just I couldn't, I, I couldn't understand it. How this was not, you know, I was watching the Syracuse, New York, Purple Rain, and then here comes this, just not, not able to handle that. Um, and then we, they also showed us the um, or, uh, another lover holding your head video had been uh, previewed on that same show, and that was taken from the Detroit concert, and you saw the whole band, and just r- ridiculous. Um, I think that I, in, in, touching on uh, Wally and them, let me say, I, I will say this in their defense. They brought, and I'm making we talk about this before, they brought show business to it. They brought what any other backup dancer brings to any other show, any other hype man or a woman or, you know, stage prop. They brought some entertainment to it which was what Prince was trying to go for. I think that the revolution is musicians. They were so tight at that point and so filthy. But I kind of think that as much as I love Wendy and Lisa and everybody marking them, I think that they might have taken the success of Purple Rain and the acclaim and you know the fact, you know, Prince and the revolution and slightly got it a little twisted because you know that band is dope no doubt about it but it's there to service Prince and they were I mean if there was tension or not they were ridiculously tight right and then of course you have these other people coming in that weren't there at Purple Rain or at least they weren't on the stage with them so you got to deal with Atlanta Bliss. You got to deal with Eric Leeds. You got to deal with Miko coming, you know, from, from Wendy's, uh, Sheila's band. You got to deal with Sheila. Well, you know, this is who he really wants to be playing <laughs> drums. And she's bad. And she's better than you. You know what I mean? Like, she's bad. She can blow, you know, and it's like, I'm sure that's some tension because you've seen all these new people from the success. And just like with anything, you know, obviously Prince is on such a high level of musicianship. And he comes from a whole different musical world than some of the other guys. And if he wants to go and do this other stuff, and he might like, well, I don't know if they can, are they going to have the chops to do this type of stuff? And I, they probably did. But I can see where, that, you know, they must probably like, ah, oh, man, how are you going to have all these people come in here? We was here, da, 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 da. And I, I get that. I understand it. But I just think it might have got a little twisted out of shape about it. I, I think they should have just... Well, it was up to Prince ultimately to change what he wanted to do. But I think that Wally and them actually brought something to the show in the same way that Maite brings something to the show. And even the same way where I don't really care for, but like um, the, those girls in Diamonds and Pearls, you know, they bring something to Prince, which is the ultimate bringer of the entertainment. And if he gets a vibe from them, then it's worth it. And I would say the greatest example of what Wally and them bring is that performance years later with Miles Davis and A Beautiful Night 
and that whole thing that they go on for like 30 minutes, that would not have been done if those guys were not up there because they put Prince in a different state of mind to do all that type of stuff, to do all the little dances, to have the band do all these different types of little riffs and different things. So I think that the parade show, the reason why Prince could shed the instruments, he could be, you know, that soul man, performer dude, was because he had, when his mind was, this is what that type of show is, is these cats, man. This is, I'm going to do a soul joint, you know what I'm saying? I want to change it up. And I just don't really think William Lee and them, they wasn't from that school, really, so maybe they just didn't really understand that. And, you know what I mean? So I wouldn't say they're not non-talented or something. Everybody brings something to the table. That's just my opinion, not to say it's right or wrong. Um, but who knows, man? Um, yeah, it's crazy. Anything on that day dropping before we wrap this you, up? You, you, all I'll say on it is that uh, I was... I was totally with the idea of him doing that type of a show then. I obviously I was what 14, almost 15 years old when all that was going on. So I mean that there was no way I was gonna be going to any of those concerts like that. But having seen the videos later on, um I would have loved to have seen it. And I'm glad that he did it that way. Um because it it was a show. And I I mean you know, I went to the music musicology tour. And that was just that. It was musicology. It was music. It was it was a schooling in how to do stuff live and how to play music and, and enjoy the art of playing music and instruments. Uh, this one here was a show, the the parade tour, and it was how to put together a show. And it only got better later on. Again, you know, it culminated, as far as I'm concerned, uh, with the Love Sexy tour, where you got a, a perfect mix of both. But here though you, you got Prince being able to just be Christopher on stage and that was that's okay uh, I thought it was I thought it was great and yeah I, I agree I don't think that, that the girls were were too keen on that because uh, you know it was he was his show he was driving it he was uh, guiding people where he wanted them to go and uh, you know being the control freak that he is I don't think that he allowed them to understand he just figured they'd go along with it and, you know, them being free birds as they are, they weren't going to. And it just caused a rift there. But as far as the concert goes, I, I thought it was awesome. I thought it was a, an awesome concert from the videos that I've seen. And I would have loved to have been there, if anything, if anything, to have heard Venus to my own life. Just to know who's playing the guitar for sure. Yeah, that would have, have been crazy. But all right, we're going to wrap this up. We, we just gave you all about two hours here, so... You know, there you go. That was Parade Reloaded. All right. So before we get out of here, I want to thank Big Ken for yep, coming yep. on, sitting down, and once again, give us the uh, information on your podcast, sir. Flavor Foundation Radio, www.theflavorfoundation.com. Uh, just dropped episode 10 last, oh, actually on more on the 31st. Episode 11 is in uh, production. All right. Soon. Cool, cool. And again, I want to thank Mr. Big Sexy and Sack. Uh, we got a new Geeked Out getting ready to drop. Actually, it's already recorded. We're putting that out this weekend. And then next week, we got something special on Geeked Out. What's that, uh, Mr. Big Sexy? We'll be taking an in depth look at the seminal classic book, Batman The Dark Knight Returns by Frank Miller. Yeah. Mm, nice. It's going to be a good one. And Mr. Day Dropping, I want to thank you again. You come through with the point system. Uh, you're always doing something that I, I don't expect, so I love that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so please, thank, thanks for coming through again. Well, thank you, and thank you guys for, for allowing me to be on this. Here. No doubt. All right. And so with that, we want to invite you to check out some of the other shows on Freedom Train Online, the Retail Pharmacy Podcast, that is our new one, with, uh, I guess, apparently, Big Ken's boy, J.M. Bovey. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! <laughs> but no, shout out to my man, John Mark, uh, doing, doing some good stuff there, something different. And also, I would invite you to check out uh, Geeked Out and check out A Place in This World. Uh, we'll give you some real stuff on that. And lastly, check out the latest episode of The Roundtable. Uh, can, yeah, men, 
<laughs> yeah, can men and women be friends? And that is all a 100% real yeah, talking. You went there on that one, dog. <laughs> <laughs> But it's great. Uh, you know, that's the type of stuff we try to do over here. So check that out. Come to the site. You already know because you're here listening. So I'm not going to run my mouth any longer. But we just want to say thank you for caring. And we are out of here. Peace. Peace. All right. Whew.